So this group of women I will be talking about are fairly well known in Serbia, but they're not usually very well known in Britain. Um, I'm going to go back to year 1915, and uh, I think we all know uh, what happened in 1915 on the Western Front. Um, there was the Second Battle of Ypres, uh, U-boat, German U-boat struck Lusitania. Um, the, in the Eastern Front, um, Russia was driven out of Poland and Galicia, and uh, the Gallipoli campaign failed. Now, in Serbia, in 1915, is considered to be probably the hardest year of the First World War. And the reason for that is that in early 1915, starting in late 1914, an enormous typhus epidemic started, and then in the second half of the year, starting at the end of November, uh, after a triple offensive by Austria-Hungary, Germany, and Bulgaria, Serbian army had to embark on a um, retreat across Albania and was joined by, the, by a large number of civilians. Now, in both these events, very important uh, in Serbian history, a group of British women played an important role. And this year, um, a, a number of events commemorated this contribution. Um, there were a series of exhibitions that were opened, as well as a whole series of um, newspaper editions of a Belgrade um, daily. Uh, this was published jointly by the UK Embassy in Belgrade and in Serbia, and uh, uh, the Serbian government. Um, under the title, Our Great British Women. And they also commemorated a number of places in Serbia that still exist and that still remember uh, the women. And many places um, have, they have, uh, towns have streets named after them, for instance. And they are totally unknown in Britain, which is interesting. Now, in World War I, there were approximately 3,000 foreign medical workers in Serbia, and most of them were women. Um, there were doctors, surgeons, nurses, hospital orderlies, ambulance drivers. One of the most famous institutions that gave this staff was the Scottish Women's Hospitals. And it is estimated that about 700 women from Scottish Women's Hospitals served in Serbia. Now, the question that I wondered, um, and I'm sure some of you do too, is who were they, who, who they and what made, them, what made them go? What made them leave um, lives of comparative luxury? In fact, we also, also have um, London Society debutantes who went to the Serbian front. They went to, left for completely unknown uh, country, unknown culture, unknown language. Um, it was a dangerous journey, um, and of course, the actual task that they set up to do, which was to help Serbian soldiers, um, was also very difficult. Um, now, their motivations varied a great deal. Uh, some of them, I think, did long for adventure. Um, some of them wanted to use the skills they had, because they were doctors, and um, as we'll see, they were not really accepted by the British Army at the time to serve um, as doctors or surgeons. Um, they also wanted um, to be useful. This transpires quite clearly. And some of them wanted to do war, just like men. In fact, a lot of them had links to the suffragette movement. Um, in 1914, um, women's professional efforts um, were not recognized, to say the least. And one of the women that we'll be talking about, Elsie Inglis, one of the first um, British um, women doctors, she was the founder of the Scottish Women's Hospitals. And she set up, it started quite, uh, quite modestly. She wanted to set up um, hospitals staffed only by women. And she set up a, a fund and she offered her services to the Royal Army Medical Corps. The reaction she received was um, very negative. Um, and this has come down in history. Um, the reaction to her was, my good lady, go home and sit still. 
So, of course, she wasn't having any of that. Um, and when they actually did set up in France, in northern France, they set up a hospital staffed with, because other governments, the British government didn't accept, other governments accepted. And um, in northern France, they set up a uh, hospital um, staffed only by women and women surgeons. And the local press became very interested. How could there be such a thing as women surgeons? So one of the journalists from the, from the French press wanted to be present at an operation to see how that looked. And so for, I guess, PR purposes, that was uh, accepted. And uh, a journalist emerged a little bit later, a little bit paler, and shouted to the assembled, presumably, crowd, um, c'est vrai, elle coupe. It's true, she is cutting. So that was, uh, that was, that was the atmosphere, generally, to, to women's profession, to professions done by women. Um, now, just very briefly, the background. Um, I do, I'm not going to go back to the origins of the, of the First World War. You'll be happy to, to know. Um, Serbia in 1914. Um, after the assassination that I'm sure you've um, heard plenty about last year at the anniversary, um, after the assassination, the preparations for, for war began in, in Serbia. Um, I think it is fair to say that Serbia did not want war um, after the two Balkan Wars in 1912 and 1913. It really wanted to consolidate its territories, not, uh, not make more war. Um, and it looked uh, pretty dire for Serbia. Um, in um, 1914, it's estimated about 90 million uh, people. Uh, that's how large the Austro-Hungarian Empire was and Serbia was uh, 4.5 million. And, and even after with the, with the um, uh, Serbia expanded about one third of its territory and the population, it still really couldn't, couldn't face um, Austro-Hungarian Empire on, an e on equal terms. Now the Entente uh, powers uh, did send some military missions, but that was fairly limited because they had their own battles to fight. And um, let's just get who was who um, to begin with. This was Field Marshal Oskar Pocherek on the Austro-Hungarian side, the chief of staff. Um, he was the, some of you may remember, that he was the survivor of the Sarajevo assassination of Franz Ferdinand. Um, some people say that he suffered from a survivor's guilt because he was also responsible for the Archduke's safety in Sarajevo. So did, that didn't <coughs> go down very well. However, he was a personal friend of Franz Josef, the emperor. So he wasn't actually removed from duty. He was a governor of Bosnia Herzegovina, which is why he was on the official visit. And um, his troops um, had a difficult um, time in 1914 in Serbia, because they, they not only faced very um, motivated Serbian troops, but also a very hostile population. Uh, one of the survivors from the Austro-Hungarian um, troops left a diary saying, we, I feel the whole country, the whole land is against us, not just the soldiers. And that was probably true. Now, on the Serbian side, um, this is Field Marshal Radomir Putnik, who was a, a veteran of Turkish wars and um, the Balkan Wars, extremely competent. Although um, in his later years, um, he was quite ill with asthma at the time. And to make things more interesting, he was actually in a spa, taking the waters at Bad Gleichenberg in Austria at the time of the declaration of the war. So when the war was declared, uh, apparently he was the only one who had the combination of the safe in the, in the headquarters where the plans of what to do if Austro-Hungarian Empire attacks. So they actually had to blow up the safe before he could get back. But get back he did, which was quite extraordinary because at the time, um, well, it was gentlemanly war. So 
he was detained at the Hungarian border on his way back from Austria and um, by, by the Hungarian um, customs, I believe. And then at the intervention of the, of the Austrian foreign minister, he was, he was actually released and he returned to Belgrade to find the safe blown up. Uh, so of course, if they had known what terrible time they would have in Serbia, I think they would have been a lot less chivalrous um, because um, the first Entente victory in World War I was uh, the Mountain Ser battle in August 1914 when Austro-Hungarian um, troops were routed and that was followed. Then there was another offensive um, in November and Kolubara River victory again uh, against the Austro-Hungarian troops. So despite that great optimism that started the war in terms of they will get rid of Serbia very easily, um, Count von Hützendorf, who was the chief of staff of the Austro-Hungarian army, he sent 19 divisions to face Serbia's 11 divisions. Although to the Russian front, he sent 30 to face Russia's 50. So there was a there was a lack of balance. Um, there's a lot that's been written, certainly in Serbia, about how come um, Serbian military was this brilliant. Well, they certainly, they defended their soil. They also had a lot of skills. They had a lot of experience. And they hadn't stopped fighting for, for years. Um, and um, what the, they also had the French-made artillery, which is quite important. Now, the victories in... Um, in the summer and autumn of 1914. They were not decisive, but they were pretty impressive. And, uh, and then there was, we had a series of, um, of articles written about gallant little Serbia facing up to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And this was in the same vein of plucky little Belgium facing the Germans. But the casualties were pretty horrendous. Um, to begin with, there were uh, estimated uh, Serbian troops were about 250,000 combatants, out of which, after several offenses, this was 160,000 dead or wounded. Of that, 2,000 uh, 2, officers. In fact, um, about 70,000 men died of wounds or disease. And the medical system was completely stretched. Um, there was very poor roads network, and there was a lack of transport. Um, I was just horrendous. There was a, it was quite, although um, one of the generals sent a, a victorious telegram after the, the last, uh, the Kolubara battle in November, no um, enemy soldier remains on Serbian soil, but in fact the casualties were very, very heavy, and this was just the beginning. And this is when typhus happened. So how did that happen? Um, well, it, it was the, the, the prisoners of war. Um, Serbs took a very large number of uh, Austro-Hungarian prisoners of war. Uh, it's estimated, although figures vary, about 40,000. And Valjevo, which is a town of Valjevo, about uh, 50, kilo, 50 miles uh, southwest of Belgrade. Uh, in December uh, 1914, it's considered to be the epicenter of the epidemic. Returning Serb troops from the front found 3,000 prisoners of war which were in, who were all sick um, uh, and in, kept in the worst sanitary conditions. Um, and then, because they, they couldn't be kept um, in one place or in several places, some of them, uh, I know, of course, people didn't know they were infected, um, they were actually sent out throughout Serbia to work as farmhands, which was the worst possible thing. So they spread the infection. And uh, so, who's to blame? The body laus. Um, pediculus humanus humanus. Um, this, was, this was known. Um, this was work done by, by uh, a French doctor, Charles Nicole, 1909 to 1911. He worked in Tunisia, and he worked out that it was this laus which spread the disease. And if you, uh, you could, if you had somebody who was infected with, with uh, this creature, well, it would just be a matter of, of time until it spread. 
Now, this was not known, or not sufficiently well known, certainly not by the Serbian um, medical authorities. And um, it is estimated that between January and March 1915, it was about half a million people who were, uh, who were infected. Um, and at the height of the, of the epidemic, there was a 40% mortality, which was awful. Now, normally a typhus, and I just have a very brief explanation, uh, which I only learned about this myself. There is a difference between a typhus and typhoid. Typhus is the actual disease, and typhoid is, um, is a, a, well, it's a disease, but it's, it's just mirroring the, the, the symptoms of, of typhus. I, it can be equally bad. Normally, they both can be treated if conditions are all right, but of course, in lack of sanitation, lack of food, lack of heat, this just became terrible. Now, this is when Serbian government appealed uh, for help from allied governments and from neutral countries too. And this is when um, the Red Cross sent uh, missions. The Scottish Women's Hospital sent three missions. There was a Berry mission, Stobart Field Hospital, Lady Paget's mission. And this is when so many women doctors in Britain, the first women doctors in Britain, went to Serbia. So I'll just give you some names. Uh, as I've already mentioned, Elsie Inglis, uh, Dr. Alice Hutchinson, she was one of the first one to go. Dr. Isabel Emsley, later Lady Hutton, Dr. Mary Phillips, Dr. Catherine Stewart MacPhail, uh, and some others. And one of them was also Dr. Elizabeth Ross. Now, she was one of the first women to qualify. Um, she studied medicine in Glasgow, and although she first worked locally in Scotland, uh, she quite extraordinarily went to work in Persia. She studied tropical diseases, and, and she worked with an Armenian doctor. And there is also, I don't know whether this is, this is a legend, but I've read it in several places. Uh, she was actually also a doctor to a harem of the powerful Bakhtiara tribe in Persia. So she was quite an extraordinary person. To make it more extraordinary, she was actually the first woman ship surgeon on a ship that sailed between Japan and India. Now, she found out from the appeal of the Russian government that there was a, there was a need for doctors in, in Serbia. And she arrived, um, went to the uh, Serbian fever hospital in Kragujevac, which is about 90 miles south of Belgrade. Almost everything is south of Belgrade because Belgrade at the time was right on the border with the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, she arrived in Kragujevac and uh, the, situations were the, the, the situation was horrendous. There were no skilled nurses and she worked for several people. Um, she was devoted, she was skilled. The conditions were horrible. Um, roads unpaved. Uh, clean water, dirty water, not properly separated. Not only was there typhus, but also recurring fever, dysentery. There was shortage of wood, shortage of food. Because it was cold, um, frostbite occurred very easily. Because uh, it was dirty, there was a lot of gangrene. So amputa amputations were rife. Now, she was adored by patients. and. Um, I was trying to put myself um, in at that time to imagine what it was like. So there's no food, there's no clean conditions, several patients to a bed, and Serbia feels very much left alone. And there is this um, group of foreigners, um, doctors, um, very well dressed because they all brought their own uniforms and kept different standards of hygiene that they tried to impose on the Serbian medical staff with different levels of success. And they were called angels and saints and completely trusted. There was absolutely never any doubt in their medical skills. In fact, the women doctors and women surgeons were preferred to ordinary army doctors. So this was, a, this was a hugely successful. However, what is um, very sad is that Dr. Ross got sick from exhaustion, and despite a lot of care she received. Um, 
She died on the 14th of February, 1915, and this was the day of her 37th birthday. Um, there was a full military funeral that was held in Kragujevac. And there is a street to this day in Kragujevac named after her. And the Kragujevac Red Cross field team also bears her name. Here lies Dr. Elizabeth Re Ross of the Military Fever Hospital, who died at Kragujevac in the spring. And she's not the only one uh, who died uh, in Kragujevac at that time. These three um, tombs have a special place in the Kragujevac Cemetery. And, um, what is interesting is that a service is held every year on the 14th of February, still today, to honor the sacrifices. One of the others uh, named on the tomb is Mabel Dearmer. Now, I've only chosen several to introduce to you. Um, each life is very special and very different. Um, now, Mabel Dearmer, um, I told you earlier that what was quite surprising is why did they leave? They didn't have to leave, and Mabel was not, Mabel Dierma was not a doctor. Which actually, she was a very gifted illustrator, dramatist, um, author of children's books. And uh, she had a successful career. Um, her two sons enlisted, and she was a, a wife of Reverend Percy Dierma. What is quite interesting with Mabel Dierma is that she was a pacifist. She absolutely hated war. Um, now, how did she end up giving her life for Serbian soldiers? She went to a service, uh, a farewell service, for the Stobad Third uh, Relief Fund, uh, led by Mrs. Stobad. And um, the service was held in St. Martin in the Fields. Um, and so she attended with, with Percy, her husband, who there and then informed her that he would be going to Serbia to serve as chaplain to the small um, British military mission. At that time, she decided she had to go too. So she immediately went to speak to Mrs. Stobart and um, asked, said, could I, could I, can I go to Serbia, please? And so Mrs. Stobart said, well, I'm improvising the dialogue. Um, she said, what are you trained for? And Mabel Dierma said, nothing. But, but I have common sense. I can learn things quickly. And Mrs. Stobart looked at her jewelry and furs and said, you will have to leave that here. So she said, yes, I will. Three weeks later, she was in Kragujevac. Now, she wrote letters. And there are several, oh, actually all of them wrote a lot of letters and diaries. And um, after the war, those that survived published memoirs. There's a, there's a whole um, treasure trove of, of, of memoirs that can be found, a lot of them uh, online that you can find. And uh, she was, we can see that she was very proud of her work. And what is quite interesting is that you read her letters and they are very poetic. Um, which is why I chose to, to introduce her to you. Um, she wrote in one of her letters to a friend, the only way to see war is from a hospital. She engaged with her patients, and she, I think she also tried to convince them that peace was better than war. Um, she didn't, she couldn't um, get that across, yeah. but there was, it wasn't, it wasn't going anywhere, but she enjoyed her work. She liked being a hospital orderly, being in charge, in charge of laundry, looking after things, looking after people. She also liked that Percy sat with officers and she was with the ordinary people. She felt that that, that, that was also good. Um, she felt very sorry for her patients, um, not just because they were wounded and, and sick, but because she felt that could, they couldn't be turned into pacifists. She said even when they were wounded, they, all they wanted was to get up, get better, go back to war. And she didn't, she, I think she found it hard to relate to that. She, 
actually wrote, she said, what I feel is that they are human beings wasted. This is another, another, another um, passage she wrote. This war will not bring peace. No war will bring peace. Only love and mercy and terrific things such as loving one's enemy can bring a terrific thing like peace. She wasn't afraid of dying. Um, she wrote also to her friend that um, if we all have to stop somewhere. So if I have to stop here, that's fine. Uh, she felt the, she saw the, the way people died from typhus was not terrible. She said you only drifted away to sleep. And um, unfortunately, she too got sick. She got typhoid and double uh, pneumonia and died on the 11th of July, 1915. There was, a, again, a very large funeral. Uh, wreaths were sent by the Serbian government officials. There was uh, the British, uh, the French, Belgian, Serbian military officers at the funeral. And one of the French, officer, one of the French officers said quite, quite wrongly, uh, but beautifully, that she died avec la noblesse d'un soldat. No, she died nobly as a soldier. Of course, that was totally wrong. That's not at all how she felt. Um, it's interesting to mention too that three months later, on 6th of October 1915, which is actually 100 years ago tomorrow, Percy and Mabel's younger son Christopher died at uh, Sulva Bay, Gallipoli. Now mention Mrs. Tobart. He's another unconventional woman. She was married to Colonel Stobart, who, who died, and then she, she remarried but kept her name. Um, she, um, she spent about 10 years farming in a remote area of Transvaal in South Africa. And then when the uh, first uh, Balkan War broke out, she took a whole um, hospital uh, relief fund to Bulgaria in 1912. So she had some experience and she had funds, she had the equipment, um, but um, uh, when the, the First World War started, her services were refused by the British Red Cross, but were accepted by the Belgian Red Cross. And she worked in Belgium until it was occupied by the Germans, and then she very nearly suffered the same uh, fate as Edith Cavell, because she was uh, arrested and accused of treason she was brought before a judge, and this is sometimes one has to be lucky. He didn't find there was, there was ground for detaining her further, and she was allowed to go free. So she worked in Cherbourg in northern France for a while, and then um, joined the Third Serbian Relief Fund to, to lead them uh, to the Kragujevac uh, hospital. And one of the orderlies was, was, uh, was Mabel Dirmer. Now, this was uh, generally a, a well-run hospital. Kragujevac was the headquarters of the Serbian army at the time. There were also Austrian uh, prisoners of war who were working there. And uh, Mrs. Stobart was very practical. She thought, yes, we have, we have to help the soldiers, but she also wanted to help um, the civilians. And um, uh, there were also other... Um, diseases, diphtheria, scarlet fever, tuberculosis. Um, so this was, uh, she did her job very well. Um, there were, in, in a lot of different diaries and letters, there are, uh, we get different sense of what it was like. She was a fairly determined woman and did not take to criticism lightly. That's, I think, probably a euphemism. Uh, but she, she ran it well. She was, uh, she was a good leader. Um, and when the, the central powers, uh, Bulgaria, um, uh, Austria, Hungary, and, and, uh, and Germany, started massing on the borders of Serbia in um, October 1915, she was put in uh, charge of a f Serbian flying field hospital. And she was actually given a rank by the, Ser by the Serbs of major. But she preferred to be known as Maika, which is, uh, means mother in Serbian. 
Now, she was um, actually Sir, Sir Ralph Paget. He was in charge of the, of the Serbian relief. And she, according to some sources, she should have consulted with him before going off on the, uh, with, the, with the Serbian army on a retreat. But she didn't. She actually willingly put herself uh, under the orders of the Serbian army. And just like uh, this particular mission, there were others. And they all had to decide, foreign missions, whether they would uh, stay in Serbia and allow themselves to be imprisoned and have their equipment confiscated uh, by the uh, arriving enemy, or um, whether they would continue on the retreat with the Serbian army. And I think about half of them did one thing and half of them did the other. She chose the retreat, took her column, which consisted of equipment, cars, carts, oxen. Um, and this is something that, that is quite hard to imagine, because the retreat um, went in the direction of, so south, escaping, if you remember, Greece was still neutral. And Greece was cut off by the Bulgarians. So the Germans were coming, the Austro-Hungarian troops were coming, the Bulgarians. And Serbian army had to retreat. And so they retreated via Kosovo onto Albania. And she, her account, Mabel Stobart's account, um, uh, echoes all the others. Uh, men by the hundred lay dead, dead from the cold and hunger, and no one could stop to bury them. But worse still, men lay dying from the cold and hunger, and no one could stay to tend to them. Now, she was 53 at the time. And the whole retreat she spent on, on horseback, which was very uh, impressive. Now, the retreat was ordered by the Serbian general staff uh, along several routes um, to uh, Montenegro and Albania <coughs> to reach the Adriatic coast and then be evacuated by the Allies. That was the idea. Uh, ret some, uh, some units took shorter time, but most units took a very long time to get to to the coast. Um, this is, uh, just to give you an idea, this was a, a seminal, considered a seminal event in, in Serbian history. Um, about 78,000 Serbian soldiers died on the retreat. About the same number estimated uh, went missing. And estimated 150,000 arrived on the Albanian coast and were, uh, were, were evacuated to Corfu. Civilians also joined the retreat because they were very worried about the, uh, about the, the atrocities uh, to, the, the, that would be perpetrated by the arriving enemy. And that the, the, the numbers are even worse. There were 220,000 civilians estimated to have joined the retreat. About, only about 60,000 survived. Uh, there were about 60 uh, Scottish women hospital staff, women, who were looked after the Serbian military medical service. They crossed Albania as well. And there was an American uh, who also was there as part of an American mission. Uh, his name is Fortia Jones. He wrote a wonderful account called With Serbia into Exile, an American's adventures with the army that cannot die. And uh, some of the pages are, are dedicated to the, the women that he met, the British women that he met. What he was particularly impressed by is that he said the practicalities of these women was, was amazing because they, when they were told they were going on the retreat, they managed to get rid of all the things they didn't need. But they did, not only did they keep the really important secret weapon, hot water bottles, but they actually had extra hot water bottles. So that was. Um, that was something worth remembering. Now, the Stobart column um, um, went on very, very slowly. Um, there were so many soldiers, so many civilians. Some people decided to turn back in the middle of awful, difficult passes, muddy terrain, frozen. Uh, people were dying of cold and hunger. And there were desertions. And in fact, in Mrs. Stobart's column, um, two people tried to desert. But she managed to talk them back to continue with her. Uh, her flying field hospital journey was 800 miles long and lasted 10 weeks. Now, she lost nobody. N no loss of life, no desertions, which was pretty 
extraordinary. She arrived in Scutari and then was evacuated on an Italian ship with her column and arrived in Brindisi on Christmas Day, 1915. Um, she was criticized and, and reprimanded for taking the equipment without consultations. This was, a, this was a, there is a little sad epilogue. She was never really recognized for what she did. Uh, she went on a speaking tour afterwards on, of the US and all the proceeds went to the Serbian relief. <coughs> Dr. Elsie Inglis, I mentioned her before, she started modestly uh, collecting for the Scottish Women's Hospitals, first with 1,000 pounds and then a little bit later she had half a million and she actually managed to equip 14 uh, hospitals. Just a little word about the name. Um, she, wasn't, she was a bit ambivalent about the name because it was started in Scotland, but a lot of uh, other women served. Um, also English and Welsh and Irish, Australia, New Zealanders, Americans, Canadians. Um, but when it started, then it was too late to change. Uh, Dr. Inglis arrived in Serbia in May 1915. Uh, so the typhus epidemic was nearing the end, and largely due to the British medical mission measures. Uh, they stopped railway traffic. That was apparently the most useful. They stopped all army leave. They insisted on disinfection, quarantine, sanitation, sewage management. And uh, in medical history, Serbian typhus epidemic is known to have been the, um, the one with the most sudden occurrence and the most rapid decline. So it, it lasted six months and there was a peak of two months. Now after that there was a lull in fighting and Dr. Inglis used this time to travel, um, look at other medical facilities around Serbia. She was particularly interested in helping civilians, especially children. Because of the availability of weapons everywhere, um, there were also incidental woundings uh, of children with weapons. She planned more field hospitals and she was also uh, very insistent about sanitation. So she tried to educate uh, Serbs she met, all the Serbs she met, about clean running water, clean running water. This was her mantra. And I think some of it stuck because the Serbs built her a memorial drinking fountain in Mladenovac, um, about 20 miles south of Belgrade, um, in memory of the Scottish Women's Hospitals and their founder, Dr. Elsie Inglis. She was there um, at the commemoration, which was done with the Serbian Orthodox Rite. Um, there were British and Serbian officers. And um, the mayor of Mladenovac said, well, Serbs are a poor nation. We can't give you much, but we can give you a guarantee that the Serbian people will remember you. So this is how they. Um, we paid her and it works. Certainly everybody knows about the fountain. Now, when the offensive started, the triple offensive, um, Inglis was going to leave uh, with, the, with the, her staff, but she got delayed and she was taken prisoner by the Austrians. Uh, still, she managed to stay in Khrushchevac, which wasn't too far away, and uh, some of her staff, they were allowed to have some freedom of movement and look after their patients, but then the conditions worsened so badly that um, eventually they were all repatriated back to England. Now, English did not stop here. She immediately organized a Scottish Women's Hospital <coughs> unit um, to help uh, a Serbian unit with the Russian army in Odessa. And that's where they served, uh, she and several other doctors. But then when the revolution came, they had to be evacuated by the Royal Navy in November 1917. Inglis was already ill for quite some time and she died one day after uh, docking in Newcastle. A uh, hospital in Edinburgh uh, had been named after her. Uh, it, it has since closed and there is a Belgrade hospital was also named after her and had, was renamed because it became part of a larger complex. Most recently, um, the British residence in Belgrade was named after her, and the ambassador to Belgrade, UK ambassador to Belgrade, Dennis Keefe, said, in Scotland, she became a doctor. In Serbia, she became a saint. 
Now, uh, I would just like to briefly tell you something about possibly the most famous one, because no story about British women in Serbia in the First World War is complete without her. Flora Sands. Um, Flora Sands was a, um, a textbook tomboy, a vicar's daughter. Um, she loved growing up with war stories, and um, she loved to write, to shoot, later drive a car. She smoked, which was frowned upon. Uh, she also trained as a typist, worked in Cairo. Um, she was trained with the St. John's Ambulance. She raced cars and even put one of her suitors in a, in a, in a hospital, after which he was no longer interested in her. <laughs> and um, now she, was, uh, she longed for adventure. That's all she wanted. And she was 38 when the war started. And she volunteered immediately. She found herself in Gragovac in August 1914. When one reads about her, and there are a number of texts about her, including her own memoirs, uh, also uh, online, uh, she was extremely adaptable. She was enthusiastic. She was able to take anything. Um, she also was quite gifted in languages. She spoke French and German, and she learned a few words of Serbian. Um, being a smoker herself, she understood that the way to get to Serbs to like you was to offer them cigarettes. So she would say, if, you, if I give you cigarettes, then please let me know if you need to have your, wounding dress, uh, your wound dressed and so on. So she was very popular. Um, she was uh, just a nurse, but she improvised things as a surgeon as well. She carried out amputations, not squeamish at all. Uh, when she realized that the funds were lacking, she traveled back um, in 1914 to collect more funds, and then traveled back to Serbia with an American doctor, um, Emily Simmons, um, to Valjevo, to the, in the middle of the epidemic, because that's where she, she, she could do something. And, um, they met an American doctor along the way who knew what the situation in Valjevo was and who told them, you won't last a month. And, um, well, the reaction to Flora Sands, in her memoirs at least, was, well, a man can only die once anyhow. So, incredibly, they both got typhus and survived. Now, the uh, intrepid Sands continued to work, then got hepatitis A, went home to recover, but then when she heard the offensive was starting in, um, in October, she decided to return to Serbia. Now, if you imagine Europe in 1915, so she, they had to take a ship from Cardiff, go all the way around to Malta, and then in the middle of unrestricted German warfare, submarine warfare, to actually take a ship to go to Salonika and then to try and get up um, to Serbia, which was already being cut off by the Bulgarian troops. And uh, she was told this was impossible in Salonika, impossible to get join the Serbian army. And this was the famous quote, people do love to tell you you can't do things, she said. Of course, she get, got through, uh, eventually joining a military hospital, then no weather closed, joining a, an ambulance unit. Then the retreat order came, and she had to um, either decide. She was given an opportunity to be evacuated. A British consul was nearby, and he said, well, you can come with me. She refused. She wanted to stay in the army. And so um, that's what she did. She was made a private in the Serbian army. She was the only British woman to have served the uniform in World War I. Um, and the uh, Colonel Vasic, who was the commander, he said, your presence will encourage the soldiers since you will represent our ally, England. She was given a mare called Diana to ride. She fought Bulgarians. She was uh, uh, traveled through mountainous terrain. She endured everything, hunger, cold. And she absolutely loved every minute of it. She would be one of these people who actually actively missed the war when it was over. Uh, she actually made it through the retreat, arrived in Durazzo on the Albanian coast. Uh, with her violin. Uh, she went on to uh, Corfu, where the Serbian army was uh, recovering, and she got through more military training, and then took part in the breakthrough of the Salonika front, was um, wounded by the Bulgarians and decorated. Um, 
it would take several lectures to cover just Flora Sand's story. Uh, there's a street named after her in Belgrade. She uh, lived on, um, she died in 1956 in, in Suffolk. Now, British uh, women are remembered in Serbia as Scottish, Welsh, Irish, English. Um, and uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter because um, um, they are remembered. And um, I think just to conclude very briefly is that um, most of us would like to think that um, we choose to remember pieces of history so that we can take with us the valuable lessons of the past to build into the future. But what did not happen opens windows to historical alternatives. Now, do women, doctors, nurses, orderlies, surgeons that we remembered today worked alongside almost every Allied army and the Red Cross except the British? So I hope you allow me to conclude that by being here today, we are uh, acknowledging a place in history for these exceptional women who served elsewhere because the British society at the time did not offer them the opportunity to contribute to the war effort closer to home. Thank you. Thank you.